Happy Bitcoin Sunday, freaks. It's your boy Odell here for another Seal Dispatch, the show focused on actionable discussion on Bitcoin and Freedom Tech. Before we get started, I want to thank all the freaks who continue to support the show. Dispatch is 100% audience funded. We do not have ads or sponsors. It is powered by our listeners through Bitcoin donations. You can donate to the show by going to citadeldispatch.com slash donate. That's with on-chain Bitcoin or Lightning. You can also donate using my pay name. Easy to remember, that's Odell. Uh, that is compatible with Samurai Wallet, Sparrow Wallet, and recently Stack Wallet on iPhone. Um, and you can support the show through podcasting 2.0 apps such as Fountain Podcast or Breeze Wallet. Echo LN is another one. Podverse is another one. There's many podcasting 2.0 apps. You simply load them up with sats, search to their dispatch, click that subscribe button, um, choose how many sats per minute you think the show is worth, and then those sats get streamed directly to my node. You can also... Um, I'm going to mute Dylan for a second. You can also... Uh, do something called boostergrams. Boostergrams are when you attach messages to your payment. The top four boostergrams from the last week's episode get read on air. We have at Auburn Citadel with 400,000 sats saying great interview. We have at full time Bitcoin ride or die freak with 100,000 sats saying thanks for banging the mandibles drum so hard, Matt. I just finished the book and listened to the interview yesterday. Excellent all around FTB. We have at Patar with 100,000 sats saying the best part was that Lionel Shriver swears like a sailor a true gem heart and then we have at mere boo hodl with fifty thousand and five sats saying epic would love a follow-up interview if she does indeed go down the rabbit hole i agree that some people are very good at seeing a problem but very rarely can they see solutions bitcoin is the solution a lot more fifty thousand sat boosts underneath that i just want to thank all the freaks who continue to support the show keeps the show going it really does mean a lot i know it's a i know it's a bear market as well i know uh we're probably in a recession if not going into a recession uh, so if you can't spare sats sharing the show with your friends and family on any platform we're on all the platforms youtube uh twitch twitter rumble bitcoin tv every single podcast app you just search Citadel dispatch also all the links are at citadeldispatch.com it really does go a long way. Um, and of course, Dispatch, uh, one of the things that makes Dispatch unique is it's a live, unedited show with direct audience participation. You can participate in the live chat, whether that's on YouTube or Twitch, that shows up on the right-hand screen, or you can participate in our Matrix chat, which goes 24-7, 365, even when the show isn't going on. Um, the link to that is at Dispatch dot com slash chat i think will bring you to that yeah still dispatch.com slash chat but it's definitely also at still dispatch.com with all that said we have a great guest in the house we have a return guest dylan leclerc our uh our resident markets analyst uh over here at dispatch how's it going dylan it's fantastic it's uh it's gonna be fun this one uh our chat two two months ago we were talking about a lot of this craziness and potential um, and it seems like it's, it's playing out. So yeah, I'm excited. So let's, let's start there. I mean, uh, we recorded still dispatch 85 two months ago, January 9th, Bitcoin was at $17,500. Uh, we probably said the words bank run 25 times in that, uh, conversation. Um, how is that? <laughs> where do we stand two months later? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not going to come out here and, and LARP like I am some, you know, top expert uh, banking analyst. And I don't think you would either. Uh, but I think it was more so following the crypto contagion as, you know, the title of the last one is Bitcoin and Global Recession. And really, like, the real recession hasn't been felt yet. It was more like a financial asset bust than anything. Um, but but I think, uh, you know, we, we talked about in a digital age, right, a little bit of panic, a little bit of losses, you know, just these conditions, these, this is during a monetary tightening, crazy things happen. And, and what exactly breaking, right? Like I forget when exactly the British guilt market uh, melted down, but like stuff like that, like no one knew, no, like knows going in what, what's going to be that thing. Um, and right now it's like, Oh, we're just starting to see that first uh, 
those, those, those second order effects, right. Following the tightening, following the historic long bond drawdown, right. Like they failed because of a duration mismatch, which we can go into the nuances. Um, but a bank run, you know, Teal oh, saying, saying to a couple startups, like, Hey, get your money out. Someone leaks it and boom, Twitter, whether it's rightfully or not. And the crazy thing is in a social media age, you can start to make some outlandish claims, not about crypto, you know, worthless tokens or whatever, but real financial institutions and boom, a run happens. And all of a sudden, you know, a st sturdy financial institution is zeroed and people and the money's not there. Right. It was all credit creation. So that this is like, this is how these, uh, these cycles get crazy. And, and we're, you know, we're up to our eyeballs in debt and we just got off the zero bound. And so a lot of these assets that were, were valued at in theory, infinity in a world where money was free, not only like 0% interest rate, but also negative, like real, a real rate. If you kind of minus that inflation, that debasement rate, um, and just getting off that zero bound in nominal terms seems like it's going to start. It's, it is throwing a lot of things out of whack. So it's going to be really interesting these next 12 to 18 months. And I think it's probably going to get crazier than, than that before. Um, yeah. So Dylan, I mean, I'm lucky enough that you're a good friend. Uh, you, I've, I've noticed through our many conversations that you tend to go fast and hard and your brain is just filled with a bunch of information that you're trying to throw out there. But let's try and unpack this a little bit and slow down. Um, first of all, freaks, if you haven't listened to Silla Dispatch 85, consider listening to it after this, uh, after this episode. Uh, we went for two hours. It was a pretty in-depth conversation. I think it's aged like fine wine um but definitely check that out but let's let's start with first of all dylan can you see can you see the live chat that's coming in from twitch and youtube on your side of the screen yeah i haven't i haven't been reading it as much but uh yeah i can see it okay i'm just making sure because i couldn't see it on my side but i can tell all the freaks are seeing it on their side so um i was just making sure it wasn't a uh restream glitch um so let's let's talk about so when two months ago when we had the conversation and one of the reasons we're having this timing right now is because to the freaks that aren't aware, um, the way uh, the stock market works is it shuts down on weekends, um, which is insane. But futures open on Sundays and futures have just opened 12 minutes ago. So we've timed this rip with futures opening, um, which people have been anticipating uh or with some level of anxiety but two months ago when we recorded there hadn't been since then we've had two bank runs we've had silvergate go down and we've had silicon valley bank go down silvergate was a major player in the bitcoin and quote unquote crypto ecosystem and then silvergate bank was much larger they were like the 15th largest bank in the world i believe they had 200 billion under deposit um, and they banked a lot of VCs in Silicon Valley and their companies that they would invest in. Um, I think an interesting place to start here is when you were looking at the fall of Silvergate and SVB, like what did you see out of that? Uh, well, I'm not going to going to say I was I covered or mentioned or even was was intimately familiar with Silicon Valley Bank before the headlines started popping up on Wednesday. Uh, most of my my bank analysis in the past really year has been around like it's, it's I've tried to focus from a Bitcoin lens. How is this going to affect Bitcoin native liquidity? And so the only ones I had really looked at in depth were uh, Silvergate and Signature, right? Uh, so I, I immediately like post FTX collapse in early November was like, okay, who's their their fiat rails? Because this is going to be at the very least like a regulatory nightmare. Um, so Silvergate was was one, and then Signature is one too. I'm I'm very curious to see what their stock does tomorrow morning because I think it's going to be quite telling if they don't have a bank kind of uh, deposit you know fund that like the the Treasury spins off real quick or like Congress you know approves very quickly. Then I think or, you know that some people say the Fed will interject. I don't think they will directly to recapitalize uh, you know a, a public bank, but at least now at this venture. But if we get a couple more bank failures, which is what they're petrified of on, on Monday uh, or this week, which is not my base case. I don't actually know how to probably like how to how to assess that probability of like, OK, are we going to get this massive run? But that's the thing, right? It's a social media age. It's a digital age. It's the first time we've kind of done a tightening cycle with information 
you know, moves as quickly. Like we, it kind of did in 08, right. But Twitter wasn't really a thing like this. It was mostly a Twitter led phenomenon, right? Like uh, the, the, the Silicon Valley bank worries, like it spread like wildfire, especially for, you know, tech based San Francisco uh, native companies, the VC companies in particular. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I think we're going to see more of this. I think there's going to be the FDIC is going to run out of money. I don't know when, but they have 120 <laughs> billion. Um, they've already probably, I don't know what they've, I, I you know, I think only like 10% of S- Silicon Valley banks um, deposits were, were actually insured. Right. Cause it was like, you know, a, a lot, a way more than 250 K for a lot of these, these uh, bank accounts. Um, but yeah, I think they potentially, the FDIC is going to run out of money at some point. They're going to have to, they're going to have to bail in uh, more of these banks, but they're going to bail the, the, that, that bail out that bail in. So customers don't lose their deposits with printed money. Essentially there's going to use a, be a whole lot of word jargon. There's going to be a whole lot of layers of obfuscation about what's actually happening and the reasons for why it's happening. Uh, but ultimately it's just going to be socialized up, up, you know, upon the, the circulating supply of dollars over the long term, like that's what's happening. Um, and, you know, who knows what what's going to I don't suspect the Fed's going to full pivot money printer, go yield curve control, you know, hyperinflation style over Silicon Valley Bank. And people, you know, people saying a Fed pivot right now are like like this is, uh, you know, this is bear, right? Like this is just like this is they're not actually real worried yet. Um, and Lehman's going to come. Right. So, yeah. Lehman hasn't happened yet. I don't think so. Um, I like, so, so my base case and I kind of like from a macro perspective uh, and like as a student of history, right. Like I, I didn't live through OA and that's obviously a reality for anyone that's familiar with me or my age or, you know, right. You were like this, five. I, yeah. <laughs> I was like seven. Um, so, but I've, I've read a lot, right? And I'm re- reading about how these tightening cycles go and these debt-based systems work and the natural like cyclicality of debt itself, right? You're borrowing from your future and societies, you know, in aggregate and human psychology uh, and, and just uh, incentive and greed, right? Like we know how these things go. And I think the bust phase, like we, we saw the fi- kind of the financial bust side of things. In my case, then even with Bitcoin at 17K, like I'll, I'll own it. I'm like, hey, Matt, like I DCA a little bit of Bitcoin every single day. I have a bunch of Bitcoin and I got actually way more cash as a percentage allocation than I did for the last couple of years. And I said that, um, and I still, I still have some cash. Like I still, my Bitcoin position is growing, but my cash position is as well. And I feel fine with that because I think, uh, the, the, the pendulum as we know it in terms of like, uh, you know, the, the business cycle, the, the global like economy, um, and also asset valuations and the value of the currency. I think these cycles are becoming, more volatile in a way, um, or like maybe have more velocity, right? Like we had the biggest asset boom following the COVID stimulus and it, and, and it peaked 18 months, months later, right? And bonds and equities drew down in tandem for the first time in 40 years. And it just wrecked a bunch of models. And now we're just starting to see like, who knows? I, I, I imagine that the Silicon Valley uninsured depositors probably get 60% of their money back, 70%. I don't know. I, 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 would, I don't really know if they're going to get fully bailed in all the uninsured deposits, but you know, maybe they raise the F- FDIC number. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but just things like this, right? Where like it would impact probably a, a million if they didn't get bailed out or bailed in. Um, like if the depositors don't get their money, then, you know, there's like a million um, employees in the U.S. that these firms that probably can't like can't make their bills or at least, you know, are going to have to lay off some people or like, you know, and like the, and this is how the, 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 the effect of monetary policy in 5% you know, yields and maybe not 5%, but just a tighter, more restricted monetary policy than was the set baseline one, two, three, four, five years back. And that just shock, that exogenous shock just doesn't happen instantly. Like I think the headlines would make you think. Uh, and it's just a slow moving kind of domino effect until they have to aggressively shove that, that, that pendulum, or I guess pendulums naturally swing, but shove like, you know, monetary policy is like a switch now. And, I, and for the longest time, it's been a dial and I think that like, that's a Luke Groman analogy, but I think like I, my so base case is that it's going to have to get for them to pivot right from like a, a political perspective um, and just what, you know, what their, their mandate is things are going to have to get bad at, and, and the overreaction. I think they're going to try to keep it tight for longer than they probably should 
because they, they messed up that transitory call so much and they're trying to gain back their credibility. Uh, and ultimately it probably blows, like my base case is it blows up in their face. Uh, but I don't think Silicon Valley is it's blowed up in their face yet. It's like, okay, you know, like these guys were irresponsible, long duration debt. Okay. Um, but it has a potential to intensify. So covered a lot there, but <laughs> those are top of mind. Dude, you cover so much in one rant. Um, the okay, well, first off, uh, so Bitcoin was at seventeen thousand five hundred. I know I'm a broken record. Um, I just always just stay humble and stack sats, right? Just hold Bitcoin in cold storage. Um, yeah. Only asset that doesn't have counterparty. Well, you, I guess gold or metals, you can hold those yourself. Um, but it's much easier to custody Bitcoin. Um, than it is, you know, a million dollars in Bitcoin is extremely easy to custody in comparison to a million dollars of gold. Um, so it's very unique in its lack of counterparty risk. Um, in these times of low trust, obviously, you know, Bitcoin is a safe haven in that result, even if the price does not um, reflect that because people panic, they want to sell a liquid asset, Bitcoin price falls. Um, the, the question isn't necessarily... As a trader, does cash make sense in this environment? Because obviously during volatile times, it's good to have, quote unquote, dry powder. I mean, I would argue that Bitcoin is dry powder. But like yeah. to anyone who's holding cash in Silicon Valley Bank, they have nothing right now. Um, so the question is, like, if you are holding cash, especially large amounts, I mean, I was let me try and unpack what you said. First of all, Silicon Valley Bank, they were one of the main banks for for tech in 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 the united states specifically smaller tech like startups vc backed startups and whatnot i have a friend who uh her company reached out they had their entire treasury in silicon valley bank it was supposed to be one of the most trustworthy banks uh in the united states it was supposed to be the most trustworthy bank in silicon valley um, and they're not going to make payroll so no one in her it's a non-bitcoin company no one in her company is going to get paid a paycheck uh, this week, maybe not next week. Who knows when they get paid? Um, so you have that issue. You also have individuals that held large amounts uh, in these banks. Um, Dylan just saw something, so I'll get to him in a second. Matt, but Signature the, Bank just closed, man. Holy fuck. crap. Signature Bank. Well, how, how did the they? Authorities. Oh, Holy shit. Balls, okay, dude. so there's there's four major banking partners. There's four major banking partners in Bitcoin and crypto. There's uh, Silvergate. They shut first. Then uh, Signature, which I guess just shut down now. Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and then we have Prime Trust, which is not like a traditional bank. They actually keep deposits in multiple other banks, including Silvergate. Um, I, do they use Signature as well? I don't know if they use Signature. They use BMO Harris. Uh, I think they use Cross River. There's another one. Um, but so the question comes down, Dylan, is like maybe maybe if you're under this 20, 250K deposit limit, you're an average person, right? The FDIC, the U.S. government essentially says we will insure your deposits up until 250K. If the bank fails, we will give you that money. Um that's one thing. But like I have a friend who has $1.6 million in a bank account. Where the fuck do you put your money if you have that much money? Like where are your options to put that money? Well, yeah. Um, your options, you're probably going to, you're probably going to, if you can get one, go to JP Morgan. Right. Which is like, like, or it's I, a big I, four. I mean, you yeah. just go to the big banks. Yeah. Well, like, no, you know, what do I do with a million dollars? It's like, you know, like, obviously I'd like, this is a, under the assumption that you like have a cold storage bag of Bitcoin and, and people that say like, yeah, but like, you know, what, what if Bitcoin goes down enough, like goes down 80%, 70%, 60%, like then how does it serve you? And like, right. you know, the answer is like own more Bitcoin then, right? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, you're complaining about the price drop. I'm just, oh, just have more money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, cause, cause no, it's, it is truly, you know, sovereign, uh, fuck you money. You know, and and th that's a powerful thing. Uh, I think people are figuring that out. Uh, but like I, you know, the, the dry powder I have uh, is on you know under two hundred fifty k and uh, and in some T bills in a brokerage account, and I can get I can get that powder to a Bitcoin platform in hours. So I'm not too, like too, really too worried about it. I guess not on weekends, right? So right. Um, 
but like I, I understand right, those risks, not risks case. but yeah, I understand those those trade offs, and I'm and I'm happy with it. But like for a lot of people, right? Like if I lived we- in. Uh, you know, if you live in a third world country, like we're seeing with stable coins, like, oh, do you want to hold these things? Um, never mind the fact that they can be, you know, arbitrarily frozen or if, you know, sanctioned or whatever. Uh, but like, you know, I would be way more in, in Bitcoin. Like I, these dollar rails and other places are, even in the US, we're seeing is shady. Um, an update on signature, the depositors aren't losing their money. I think their bank's just getting shut down. It says, uh, it, so it says shareholders and certain unsecured debt holders will not be protected. Senior management has also been removed. Any losses to the deposit insurance fund to support uninsured depositors will be recovered by a special assessment on banks as required by law. Um, so depositors are made whole. Signature shut down. Signet for crypto. Signet Send Network for Silvergate were the biggest fiat rails behind the scenes. It was almost like a slush fund. Uh, of of it was like an off chain stable coin, right? If you think about it like that, where the sil- uh, signature and uh, Silvergate, and even to an extent the Silicon Valley Bank, right? If you if you look look up how they got their deposit base massive, and this we have this massive everything bubble, right, Matt? Crypto goes up. Uh, I mean, yes. there's been a you know already a 12 year bull market in uh, in equities, right? But private equity and all these things that are just trying to chase higher and higher returns right it turns into just like just like literally chucking money at anything any startup and there's this massive bubble in like you know the private sector right the tech sector um you know you had you had software as a service companies that were just it was basically like you know a delivery service with a network effect right like be worth billions and billions of dollars scooter companies scooter apps billions of dollars spacs you know it was all this free money and so these uh Silicon Valley was like, yo, like, bank, the bank with us will give you easy loans. We'll give you, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll give you easy access to credit. And it worked during a virtuous up only VC, uh, you know, cycle, right? Um, same with uh, S- Signature and Silvergate. They're like, okay, come here. You'll get access to the Send Network. You'll get access to Signet. You'll be able to send money to, to all of these crypto companies. Um, the the trade off is that the cash you keep, it's, it's zero in straight deposit. So we'll make a you know a killer spread because we're going to go buy tre- uh, you know ten year treasuries at a hundred basis points of yield, one percent yield, and we're going to rake in money, you know, locking in this one percent while we pay you zero. And they realized like, oh, you know, well, one, it was FTX failing, the KYC stuff, AML, but there was, that was already masking a problem of if you're in long duration securities, meaning you you lent money to an institution to the government or, you know, maybe, maybe it's mortgage backed security pool. Uh, you're saying, okay, you know, I'm going to lock in a 2% yield on a mortgage bond or 3% yield on a mortgage bond for 30 years. Right. And as mortgage rates go from three to 7%, you, you didn't lose your initial investment because the money wasn't really has, doesn't exist right now. Anyway, it's just marked to value as this, as if the money exists today and you're going to get paid in the future. But as those interest rates rise, it messes up that present value equation. And so the bond value falls, right? So like, but the banking system, the, the, you know, the accounting, like they do all these fancy things that like they have the asset until they actually need to sell it. Uh, and they can only get the, the current value of it. And it's a lot lower than what they paid. And so that's, you know, that's, that's what's bursting, right? Is this all encompassing everything bubble in, in duration where money was free out for 30 years, right? Like the, the value of all these companies, the real value was infinity because the cost of capital was negative. And so the, all these weird things happened and, and, and the epicenters of that, I mean, crypto and, and, you know, Silicon Valley tech were like two of the kind of the hot, hot flying sectors. Well, these banks are now getting, you know, shot behind the shed. So I think it's interesting. I don't, the signature thing, I kind of reacted strongly because it's just another one of those U S dollar off ramps on ramps, right? Whatever happens with circle, I think circle will be fine, but like there's, there's going to be somewhat of a regulatory. USDC is going so like, down. Yeah. So, so that's going to be Wait, really interesting. You think, you like, think USDC will be fine? Um, Do you have your cash in USDC oh, right now? Fuck no. Uh, no. Excuse my French. Sorry, mom. <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't. I don't think that makes any sense. Um, well, the interesting thing is like, I, so they only have their buffer as stated on their reserves. Is only forty-seven million between the the the, 
the value of their treasuries and the uh, USDC circulating supply. But I wonder how much of a, a, a treasure chest they have behind the scenes because the USDC like incentivized, you know, indirectly, indirectly or directly, they've, they've incentivized big firms, traders, uh, liquidity providers to use USDC. They've almost like paid them to do it. Right. And to, to, you know, get USDC coins in circulation, try to create like a quasi network effect. Guy uses it. And all of a sudden as rates, short end rates go from zero to like one to two to three to four to five, uh, percent, the, the stable coin issuer business gets quite, quite lucrative. Um, and so whether they're, you know, like some people think this is like some elaborate plot to, you know, Silicon Valley bank, bank run to, you know, and they're not going to get bailed out because it's going to screw USDC and screw crypto. Like I read that on Twitter on uh, this weekend. I'm like, guys, this is insane. But I, it just highlights like the risk, like you, a USDC circle was like establishing all these banking partners to diversify their risk. Right. Um, and they got, you know, 80% of the customer's money, like on, uh, with BlackRock or BNY Mellon, both of them, just like in short duration treasuries. And in theory that, you know, that makes like, I think a hundred million, 150 million a month. Right. Uh, but who knows how much of a treasure chest they have. They said, I think Circle said over the weekend, I hadn't been too tuned into the news flow on Saturday that, that uh, they would cover it with corporate funds. And that's why USDC bid, I think it's at 95 cents. Um, but the interesting thought is like, Matt, as so, this, if, if they're truly redeeming, you know, one USDC for $1, they said that. Uh, and tomorrow you have all these people that are holding 95 cent market value USDC tokens. Um, and even if the price goes up a little bit, just anyone with an incentive or interest to get a $1 worth is going to go to circle and they're going to burn their USDC and they're going to pull their cash. And so that $3 billion hole, and it's not a $3 billion hole. Like what if, you know, there's a 70% recovery value or well, 60%. Most of the whole... Just to be clear, most of the whole is SVB, and it looks like it looks like the Department of Treasury, Federal Reserve, and FDIC just said that they're going to bail out all depositors, uh, regardless if you're over the insurance limit for Silicon Valley. They just said that um, tomorrow. When did that news drop? Yeah, it they just like said just that. Or I missed it earlier. Um, wow. No, they just said it right here. I put it in our private chat. Um. They're, they're not bailing out shareholders. They're not bailing out unsecured debt holders. Senior management is removed. Um, they think they can cover everybody by just selling off assets, but they're gonna they're gonna backstop the whole thing and say that all depositors will be made whole on Monday, <laughs> aka tomorrow. Wow, this is insane. This is. I mean, I'm not. I'm so not like mad or. Are they, this is just and like, they said that same thing for insane. Signature, right? That's the same idea for Signature. They're just going to bail out depositors instead of shareholders. Well, so I the, I have a question with the, the Signature thing. Like, I, are they zeroing shareholders? Did they just announce that? Like, they're, they're just winding it down. Um, I don't know. I don't have the Signature happens. link. Where's the, where's the Signature news? Oh, I don't have the Signature news. I'm just looking at the Silicon Valley Bank news. Uh, BB, uh, that tier 10 k crypto you know, the crypto Walter Bloomberg posted it all. Oh, so, I mean, that should, that's where Circle's USDC issue was on SVB primarily, uh, or presumably. Um, so maybe USDC escapes from here, but I just... Wow. I just... Wow. Can, can we really stop the contagion? Does the contagion really stop here? Like... What kind of who's going to keep their money in a regional bank when they can just move? They're going to move to the big four, like, like it's only the top banks. Like, why would anyone keep over 250K in any other bank right now? Um, I mean, obviously, people should move into Bitcoin, but now they might not even be able to easily move into Bitcoin because Signature and Silvergate are out of the picture. Well, it, like, think about Coinbase. Like, Coinbase is one of their biggest uh, Coinbase. Uh, they were like, hey, guys, like, don't worry, we're leaving Silvergate. Uh, and now we're heading right to Signature. And so, like, I bet Coinbase being a public company, you know, et cetera, like they're, you know, doing it right, um, just from like a compliance perspective or whatever, even though they're recently kind of giving a middle finger to the SEC, um, which, you know, respect them for it, taking them, taking on the man, um, the reasons why we could, we could talk about, but uh, what's their dollar rails now, right? Like, I, I don't, I don't, maybe not Coinbase, but like all of these other bucket shop derivative exchanges that had U.S. banking relationships, 
over the last year. Like Binance just got cut off. Like all these second, third tier uh, operations institutions got cut off. Uh, it, you know, the international Signet and Silvergate presence was strong. Uh, and there's still, and, and like that uh, also like stable coins served a big part in that. And that's getting cracked down real hard. Um, so I think it's just going to be really interesting to watch where I have no doubt that like Bitcoin uh, will do well if broad, if broad risk assets do well, it'll do the best. Um, but if we're thinking about crypto native whales uh, or rails for Westerners to onboard to Bitcoin, like if you had in theory, Matt, you know, a bi billion dollars to allocate, you asked me this last time, like, what would you do with it? And, you know, or like, where would you put it? Um, we talked about this last time, like aside from Bitcoin, if you wanted to have cash, stay on like, the stack if, you get, if you wanted to get that money to Bitcoin now with, you know, a lot of money, like, where do you go? What do you do? Like, what do you do? And that's going to be Would really you see the hash rate is screaming right now. I mean, we have we have mempool.space up on the screen share because we have mempool.space every time for every dispatch. And uh, the next difficulty adjustment is going to 16 percent difficulty increase. Um, I mean, if you want to get money into Bitcoin right now in large amounts, you'd probably be to secure ASICs and start mining. You think so? It's just a theory. I, <laughs> um, yeah, dude. I and like also like try buying. I'm I'm watching these spreads and watching uh, just how Bitcoin trades uh, and like these order books and like there's you know if you had to buy a billion dollars of Bitcoin, like a billion dollars entering the system would would send this thing pretty hard because the markets are super illiquid. Um, I try to beat that home in recent I mean, we're months. pumping right now. Pump, yeah, everything's pumping pretty hard. Equity's up 80 bips, screamed up higher. Uh, and, and that, that uh, those, those facilities, right? The, like what they just announced that they're just going to, Silicon Valley Bank's going to be made whole, Silvergate uh, or Signature well, Bank. Well, the Not that they're itself. insolvent. Yeah, yeah. Not that they were insolvent, but that like i think this is like an important important point to understand for how the fiat system works but like when those fractional reserve banks collapsed right that money those deposits were just destroyed so markets are pumping right now because they they basically said like we're going to we're going to fill that hole we're not going to let that money destroy get destroyed contract right um and so that's that's why markets are up that's why bitcoin's up perfectly logical and i would expect to see that um it's going to be interesting to see uh you know, if there's any other kind of panics, right, um, just as a second order result of what we just saw, because um, the banks were still trading pretty poorly. So who knows, maybe they determined that this was it. But I'm, I'm, I'm also curious to see what happens with signature um, share, like shareholders, like does the stock zero or does it just stop trading? Because I know a couple of people that, you know, um, have had put on short positions. Um, I've played the stock a bit as, as with Silvergate. Um, but yeah, that's going to be interesting to see. Like, I don't, I don't know what happens with the equity of, of Silicon Valley Bank too, because they like traded th to thirty dollars pre market, but they didn't let it trade after one hundred seven. Like, that's the brutal thing. Like, there's there's people that were short legged these things. They were completely right about it being a bank that was going down to fail, and then you know, Treasury comes in, FDIC comes in, they're like, nope, shut it down, and then the stock just never trades again. It's pretty. It's a brutal game. Yeah, I mean, it's a rigged market. Uh... The, I mean, it seems if I'm reading this, by the way, we just sent each other the same press release. It's, it's the same press release that, that says they shut <laughs> down Signature Bank and ah. Silicon Valley Bank. That's how quick all this is moving. We're just like, we're not reading the whole thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> if I keep reading into this, I mean, it, it reads like Signature is done. All yeah. management is out. Shareholders are zeroed. And depositors are being made whole, which yeah. does that, I mean, maybe they think that will stem contagion, but if you're a shareholder of a smaller regional bank, why are you holding shares in that bank? If the government can just come in and zero you out in a heartbeat, so that, it so kind that of creates a run down. on the stocks. Yeah. yeah. Right. And is my yeah. take there correct? I think that makes sense. I think, yeah, I think it's, that's, that's a really interesting point. I hadn't even thought of um, in this context previously is uh, and that's, and there's an interesting kind of reflexive relationship between uh, you know, confidence in a bank, it's equity price um, and it's a virtuous cycle on the way up and way, way down too. Right. 
that equity capital and what the bank can lend out um, as its assets are booming and its stock is as well. Um, you, I mean, that's why the, the, these bank stocks were down 80%, right? It's because their deposits had gone down, rates had gone up, it had cut into their margin, and they invested all in the long that long duration crap. Um, but yeah, if I'm, why would you hold a regional bank stock right now? So, so what that what that in this uh, you know index looks like tomorrow is gonna be really interesting. Um, Fuck. Who knows? But, yeah, I mean, if you look back at SVB, like the way the whole SVB things went down was they seemed pretty much solvent still, um, but they were like covering their ass a little bit. So they decided to sell some stock and that tanked the stock price. And then that kind of spooked everyone even more into the bank run kind of situation, just to show like the connection between the, the stock price and the stock's performance and confidence in the bank. You know, if you see a, a, a bank stock fall by 60% or something, uh, most people are going to try and, and and escape the bank. I mean, there's there's no negative of moving your funds. You don't get penalized. You can always move back later. Um, yep. And I, I would also say another thing that I thought was was really interesting about this, and we talked about this two months ago, is this idea of, you know, 2008, there was no social media, so they could control a lot of the narratives. Um, whatever your favorite mainstream shit news platform is, um, they're all in the pocket of, of government officials and, and their ad sponsors. And as a result, um, a lot of that publicity, right? And we even talked about, you know, potentially inciting a bank run, you could be hit with a felony. Um, that combination meant that the news didn't really get out. But now that we live in a social media generation, um, a social media dominated society, uh, this shit spreads like fucking wildfire, like super quick. Like I, the, as we watch the trust and in institutions break down, like that can happen way, way, way quicker um, than ever before. And that's kind of what we're witnessing over the last week or so. Yeah. Yeah. We, we probably had not seen the end of it. Like, like we don't know. And this is, you know, every, everybody became, it was kind of a meme, right? Everybody became a banking analyst on, on Thursday and Friday. Yeah. Um, not this a is, banking this analyst. Is the, yeah, yeah. This is the most interesting thing about, uh, about uh, you know the social media era today and how 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 fast everything spreads information knowledge um, and we don't know what that next thing is going to be right um, and you know markets are up big right now uh, I think it's interesting because uh, you can look like you can look at these like you know future curves for like Fed funds futures for for the interest rates right and and basically they those are down you know just on the open right like they're down thirty basis points like in twenty twenty four so. The, the, these cuts or these these hikes are getting rapidly taken off the board. Um, everybody's seeing it hit, like they can't raise anymore. Um, where just just last week they thought they were going to raise another 50, 50 basis points uh, later in March. So I think that's going to be interesting. I think the Fed still wants to, despite this, it's, this is more of a Treasury facility to kind of come out and uh, I mean it's a joint statement, right? Um, I, I guess we, do we know the specifics? Like, what is the Fed monetizing this? um additional funding dude i I, mean, the, the, I know nothing i'm a i'm a simple person i just stay humble and stack sats i brought you on here because you know you know all the things <laughs> yeah dude okay got it fair enough um yeah I, it's gonna be interesting just to see i, I don't think we've <laughs> heard the end of 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 you know this whole maybe it's not a bank run but um yeah until the fed really turns on their bazooka but who knows i'm not an expert either don't listen to i me. mean you I mean, it, yeah, uh, we have scale bar in the chat. Like, is this the pivot? Um, no, but I, I think, mean, it, this I doesn't think, necessarily seem like it. Yeah, I think this is like, there's going to be a moment where people will, like are convinced it is the pivot uh, and they're probably going to, you know, put their foot on the, on the brakes again. So who knows? I, I, I also have, you know, I, I kind of have a, the, the bliss of having that long-term, uh, you know, stay humble, st stack sats mindset. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly bullish on Bitcoin on the long term, and especially like in the wake of all of this, the the orange pills that are being doled out. You know, it's kind of ironic too, right? Matt? Like Bitcoin being the, the best performing asset in the 20, 20, 20, uh, 2010s, uh, outperforming everything. Liquid against all, you know, Silicon Valley VC dart throwing. 
right? During this like, you know, up only tech bubble virtuous cycle thing uh, to the, and then, you know, San Francisco peaked <laughs> kind of in like that 2020 range, uh, COVID. We had like the, this everything bubble, uh, you know, uh, cycle upwards and then an implosion. Uh, and then all the Silicon Valley, I guess they got their money back, but like for a moment, they thought they lost everything. They got completely rugged. Uh, and their money wasn't their money, right? Like I've been tweeting a bunch of Matrix memes recently. Like I think I a lot of people woke up this week uh, to to the fact that okay, yeah, you got your treasury bailing. Maybe that makes you feel better. Um, but that like just like people are like what? I'm an unsecured creditor. What is that? And it's like oh, you know, you didn't read that you know five page document the bank hands you when you, you sign up for this account. You are an unsecured creditor. Uh, to this institution. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty big, uh, you know, if not orange pill, red pill, maybe black pill <laughs> for a lot of people is like, they didn't know these things. They'd never thought about it. It's a Western privilege to not have to think about these things. And when you're, you know, an elitist tech tech executive in San Francisco and you get rugged, it's like, wait, what? So, I mean, part of my thesis is that Part of my bold thesis for Bitcoin and freedom tech in general is this idea that people are just going to keep getting burned. And then as they get burned, they will learn their lesson now and they will seek out alternatives that are that are better and more sovereign, including Bitcoin. Um, now, is this the moment? Is this is is this the great realization that's happening or did they just get a handout? And as a result, there, there won't be a lesson learned here. Is this hyper Bitcoinization? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I like this is just another one of those those moments. I think the USD DC thing too is like one of those moments where like there's just it's just gonna yeah people are gonna continue to get burned. I'm not saying Circle is doomed imminently or whatever, but like oh the stable coins aren't actually inherently stable. It's that uh, it's you know it's a bunch of assumptions that you know you don't get rugged. They don't mess this up. You know there's trust inherent in in all of these assets. Uh, that are supposedly mine. You'd be fucking, you'd be fucking insane to be holding a large amount of money on USDC. Like, who the yeah. fuck are these people? Yeah, it makes no uh, sense to me. Yeah, like, well, yeah, that's why Circle like incentivizes people because because why would you own cash at zero with zero percent? Right, cash right now gives you five percent. If you you can like, I mean, right. investing in, I, I guess. Getting T bills to to Bitcoin might take a couple of days if that's what you're talking about. But like, if you're not doing anything illegal, so T bills is short term. T bills are short term yeah. loans to the U.S. government. Yeah, and 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 it's synonymous with the the system is it's it's synonymous with cash on the short duration. So like you know the shortest end of the the U.S. Uh, Treasury you know debt securities like they're not going to default upon them. The, their value is not going to fluctuate, and you're basically just getting a steady income stream. Which for the last you know ten years post GFC was 0%. And now it's, you know, four and a half, five percent 5% in nominal terms, right? You can still say that that real yield is negative after inflation. I, I'll take that. That's fair, maybe. Um, I mean, uh, it depending. definitely is. Yeah, that is, that is I mean, fair. Inflation's like um, 12 to 15%, right? Like what? Yeah, yeah. And, and inflation is is obviously not just an, an average index when your, your life and depending on what you're buying and how you want to I want to consume inflation is definitely more than the, the stated CPI, but that's, you know, kind of another, but I, another I, will talk, agree. But I will agree that T bills, T bills make the most sense. If you're going to lend the U S government money, like, I don't know who the fuck is lending the U S government for 30 years at 4% is fucking insane. <laughs> like with their track record, like how would you, how do you, how, who's deciding that makes any sense? Like how, I mean, obviously market participants are pricing that in, um, and they yeah. think like for risk adjust adjusted returns, like 4% for a 30 year loan is makes sense to the US government. But that's fucking insane to me. Like, given their track record, I wouldn't even let them sleep on my couch. <laughs> yeah, no, the long duration stuff still. I mean, Greg Foss, I would like, yeah, I think you were as well. Like, I would like to say myself, we're hammering the, the drum at 1%. 2%, you know, long, long end yields, right? Like, why would you lend the money, the, the US government any money at 1% before inflation for the next 30 years? Why would you ever lock that in? And like, this is a lot of the stuff that yeah. those banks bought. This is what pensions were buying, right? Like the 60, 40 portfolio is the assumption that, oh, don't worry, if stocks ever fall, bonds will rally. And it wasn't stocks falling this time that triggered everything it was bonds falling. 
So all their portfolios and models and correlations were like blown, blown up because the long end went from 1% to 4%. And even at 4%, it's like, you know, you're still betting that, that, you're still, you know, investing under the assumption of any return. But I think at 4%, like I would, I would honestly expect us inflation to average over 4%, maybe 3%, 4%, I think higher than 4%, honestly, because I think we're going to find, you know, an exponential part of that issuance. I think we're maybe already there uh, for the dollar, but yeah, it doesn't really make all that much sense unless you're investing other people's money, which is why is, is who's buying the 30 year stuff, right? It's pensions, it's endowments, it's, insurance companies um and, yeah, and a lot of them have mandates where they have to right yeah yeah so i mean who's buying it it's like oh your you know your 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 pension is or your financial advisor is under your on your behalf you don't even know it <laughs> but like well, it, it's weird man like we're, we're like talking about the two types of cash right the two types of cash like that everyone thinks of and they just you know see the you know, the digits on the screen and USD and they feel, feel good about themselves. Cause like in, in first world countries in the U S financial system, like bad things don't happen. And, and even after 08, like people like bad things don't happen. Right. Um, and so, you know, but the money that, that you have in the bank is just there. Right. And they're fractionally reserving it and lending it out in the long end. It doesn't actually like physically in a vault for you or digitally in a vault segregated for you. Right. That's understood. Some people get that, but even like on the short end, like, like short end treasuries or long end treasuries, like that money doesn't exist yet, right? Like it's just, it's an IOU. It's like this, this debt based system, when you actually break it down, think from first principles, like it's so wacky and insane. And that, and it's just obviously normalized, right? We haven't grown up in any other environment. So thinking outside of this, you know, box of a system doesn't make all that much sense, but like a bare asset, like Bitcoin, you know, with a password, with a username and password, right? Is, is, is much actually easier to understand for anybody today that hasn't, you know, already been indoctrinated by like this current system, right? I think that like, when you talk to anyone my age, anyone younger, um, and really anybody that's competent with, with technology and systems is, you know, Bitcoin is, is obviously a much, is a much more natural system, right? It's like almost like a return to the norm, not a return to the norm, because we've been in this banking system for a while, but it's just like, you, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Or am I just rambling? No, no. I mean, it makes sense to me. Um, I mean, it, it it's at least a return to sound money, like at least like where we were kind of at the gold standard times. Um, obviously, there were a lot of bank failures back then as well. Um, I uh, First of all, there's a comment from CBDC engineer, if now's a good time to read mandibles. It's always a good time to read mandibles, but especially now. And if you haven't listened to last week's episode uh, with Lionel Shriver, the author of Mandibles, definitely check that out. Um, but on the corporate cash side, uh, there's two elements here, right? Because the SVB is interesting because it, it mostly hit corporates. And maybe this is just also my own bias or my own differing perspective. I mean, 2008, I wasn't as young as you, but I was still young. Um now, you know, I'm a partner at a venture fund, 1031. And like, so the last two months, three months, we've been talking to all our portfolio companies, you know, what exposure do you have? Like, there's a lot of concerns about different banks. I mean, our, our conversation we had two months ago, I was yelling about bank runs. Um, so we've been in a lot of dialogue with the different founders that we back. And, you know, for better or for worse, the ones that come back to us and say like the majority of our treasuries in Bitcoin, we're very comfortable with that. Like that is the, like, they will make payroll next week, no matter what the fuck happens, they will make payroll next week. The ones that are playing games that are like running between bank to bank because they, these guys have big treasuries, right? They have to hold large amounts of, of dollars. Um, like USDC is probably the extreme example of that. Right where they have to hold billions of dollars of collateral. And it's like, where do you put it? Where do you put, you know, $5 million operating treasury uh, for a small to medium sized business? Like how, how do you keep that secure while still having a functioning business? And I think for a lot of them, like Bitcoin should become more obvious. Like hey, you don't have to put your entire treasury in Bitcoin, but there's gotta be some of these. I mean, I, I hate that all in podcast, but like I was listening to it this week just because they all got fucking rugged um, and they were freaking the fuck out. 
right? But if some of their portfolio companies were 50% treasury and Bitcoin, they would be able to pay their payroll this week. And I wonder if any of them are starting to realize this or if it's going to take more. Um, as some will realize probably the majority will take longer, right? Yeah, Jason, Jason's manic tweeting was pretty funny after he's been like shitting on Bitcoin for a while, you know? It was like, there was like all oh, caps, caps. Like, caps. Yeah, yeah, that was, it was funny. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they, maybe they get it. I think some of them, I, I, I still keep coming back to it, like mentally, like the signature thing. I'm just very fascinated to see how it all plays out. Um, Cause that's like, there's, there's only two crypto banks like that, that for, for big, for big companies for like a lot of these companies that you've never heard about that are like, you know, that were kind of like backbone, uh, maybe not for the Bitcoin complex as we want to think about it, like the miners or whatever, but I'm sure a lot of miners were at signature and, and Silvergate. Um, but like, you know, the, for the, like the crypto economy, right? Like, signature silvergate were where you went and and the regulators are serious they're playing game they're calling all the, the entire industry unregistered securities they're calling out fraud um people gave respect and, and and rightfully so gave the sec a whole lot of shit in 2020 uh one in 2022 for not really doing anything and they thought there was people going to walk scot free and now the all these altcoin you know labs right where it's like oh we're not you know it's a decentralized crypto and then that's like you know one lab uh insert blank here uh created the protocol you know has a bunch of funds ico they like all of those guys are getting busted they're getting actually you know sued indicted uh and now you know they can't really get right. banking relationships um like it was funny like i i saw on a tweet today it was like dydx like i don't really follow all the crypto stuff but i i i know it a little bit and the DYDX is like a decentralized uh, perpetual swap, decentralized futures protocol, but they have right. a token, of course, right? And it was like someone was tweeting about decentralized like, Bitmax. Yeah. And someone was tweeting about decentralized Bitmax access to a bank account. They're like, oh, DYDX, like, I think maybe they were at, at, at one of these banks. And I was like, wait, what? Like, they have like a bank? It was just, <laughs> it was just so laughable and paradoxical. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of all of those guys, right? Like, I, I really wonder who's going to bank with Coinbase for their USD rails. Like, I know that I think they're at JP Morgan for like their corporate funds, but for like this, their, their customer funds, right? Um, for all the exchanges, Silvergate and Signature were the guys for Kraken, OK, like na you name it, right? I'm not even picking on any individual names. So who comes, who steps up to the plate, if anyone, Um you know, without much tighter regulatory scrutiny on the whole Bitcoin crypto complex. And I'm lumping them in just for the sake of it. But I think, you know, we're starting to see a real distinction between Bitcoin and crypto in the eyes of authorities where that wasn't previously. Um, I mean, you know, the New York uh, AG calling Ethereum a security and, and explicitly calling out uh, staking as an investment and, uh, you know, naming Vitalik, right? Like, these are, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with it or not. I don't really. I'm more of an anarchist at heart. Um, this is why the bailout things are so like laughable. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see just like the second order. I know Bitcoin's pumping right now, you know, even like Ethereum, all the cryptos are pumping, right? Because that's, that's what happens when Bitcoin goes up. But it's going to be really interesting to see how the next three to six months, never mind the macro, more the micro of regulation, Western financial. Uh, interests probably saying, you know, hey, go knock down Circle's door, go knock, knock down Tether's door. They're calling stablecoin securities, right? Because issuing a stablecoin is a pretty lucrative business with rates at 4%, with rates at 5%, right? JP Morgan, BlackRock, and, and all of them want a piece. They want a financial interest in that business because that, that's where Circle and to, to an extent Tether for offshore money start to step on their toes is making a spread at zero, you know, giving an, an IOU to someone that pays zero percent interest and get receiving five for yourself is a pretty good business for a seventy, you know, seventy billion dollars of funds, 20, forty billion dollars of funds. Um, so even though Circle's fine, right? Like USDC should probably is probably going to trade back to a, a buck. Yeah, um, and you'll be able to get your money out if you want. Um, unless you're, I don't know like, about you know, that. Who knows? Right? I mean, I mean, I it wouldn't surprise me to see a rug. No. Um, but yeah, I think just in general, we're going to see more of a, a clampdown and the access to USD rails for a lot of these companies that weren't compliant of, with law or, you know, 
unregistered securities or whatever it may be are going to have trouble getting access to USD rails. Um, yeah, real trouble. So I think it, it'll be interesting to see who steps up to the plate. I think next bull run, you're going to see those, you know, legacy incumbents. Um, they're going to really try to try to get in on the Bitcoin side of things uh, in some way, at least, you know, whether it's banking companies or whatever else, right? Because there's going to be another bull cycle and there's going to be another crypto native credit boom. But I think it'll be to an extent a less lesser of a wild, wild west. Um, and more so, you know, they'll try to implement regulatory capture from the start. Um, and KYC being obviously one of those processes. Yeah, I mean, if you look at no matter how this plays out, I mean, you got to just follow the incentives, right? And if you follow the incentives, even without additional regulatory capture methods, um, we're probably going to see consolidation on both fronts, both in the traditional banking sector and uh, Bitcoin on and off ramps, right? So, I mean, when you talk about, well, first of all, I don't really think this helps much in terms of confidence in the traditional financial system. So there's a lot of people that already placed wires to try and transfer to the big banks um, that they think are, quote unquote, too big to fail and will get bailed out. Those people aren't going to pull back their wire. So we're going to see a lot of consolidation there. And then on the Bitcoin on ramp, off ramp side, I mean, when you start to talk about Silvergate, when you start to talk about Signature, um, less so SVB, because they actually were like kind of picky and choosy on, on who they banked in the Bitcoin and, and quote unquote crypto space. Um, those were mostly for like the smaller fringe players. If you start to look at the established people, right? Like I believe Cash App uses maybe Sudden and Cross River, I think, are what they use. Like Robinhood has got all these major banking relationships that they already have. Coinbase probably, you know, is, is in with the big guys at this point. Um, it's really the smaller, there, there'll be way less competition on the on-ramp, off-ramp side. Like I expect there to be massive consolidation there. And then that makes our on-ramps, off-ramps even more vulnerable than they already currently are, right? Because these are heavily regulated companies. They're massive companies. Um, there's a lot that governments can do to, uh, to threaten them and uh, compel them to do certain policies. Agreed. The word of the day is consolidation. <laughs> I, I was reading a little bit on the side. Um, it was this, this is Bloomberg's uh, chief uh, fixed income strategist um, talking about the, the new Treasury Fed facility. Um, and it, the, the Fed's allowing the banks uh, to, to uh, post their, their bonds as collateral in exchange for uh, liquidity. And they're valuing the assets, mortgage-backed securities and treasuries at par value. Um, so not the value at mark to market, but the value that it was. Like this is just an accounting trick. Um, and, and liquidity credit extension is, is just, is, is essentially the money supply, right? Which is why defaults and, and default yeah. cascades contract the money supply. So this is, I mean, that I think this, and what the guy said, uh, following that, as he, he posted the, you know, breakdown of the facility and what it is and is saying, you know, the, the assets will be valued at par. He said, if I wanted to dream up a version of a rescue that would allow the fed to continue hiking and ignore this mini crisis. I'm not sure I, I could have done a better job than this reality. So, so, you know, the money supply essentially quasi increases, you know, they back up this liquidity doesn't get destroyed and go poof. Um, so markets rally, risk rallies, Bitcoin rallies, equities go up. Um, but, you know, they potentially can continue to, uh, you know, what the, the people think to pivot, this is like more of just like a little mini bailout, um, which is printing money. Um, I wonder what the extent of their balance sheet will increase um based on this uh but yeah Wait, so let's continue. let's unwind this un unpack this for a second because i mean i'm a little bit confused which means the freaks are confused um I, so with svb silicon valley bank one of the reasons they failed was because they my understanding is because they had these 10 year 10 year bonds and they had um they had 10 year bonds they had like 10 year mortgage backed securities and stuff and they were paying low rates so as a result their current value is they they have massive losses on the current value um 
and they, they didn't have to mark to market. So they didn't have to say that they had current losses on it. They only have to say it when they actually sell. Um, and then, so then they were forced to sell because they were trying to cover their deposits. Um, and as a result, they took heavy hits. What the Fed is saying now, or is it the Treasury? Whoever is saying, someone's saying right now that they will they will treat those as if they're full value instead of the the current market rate for them, the current market price for them. Is that that's what they're saying? Yeah, they're they're saying they can bypass the uh, the mark to market price. So then who pays the shortfall? Matter. Well, the short the shortfall is that the the mark to market value of the bond doesn't actually actually have to be realized through an accounting trick, where the Fed values the collateral. So that the, I mean, I guess the shortfall is that you know as depositors are are, are made whole and if if they need to withdraw, right? Um, like you know what what panicked everybody about Silicon Valley was that they sold the bonds so that you know that magic accounting where you know these thirty year bonds, twenty year bonds, ten year bonds are valued at. Uh, you know, hundred percent of what they were lent plus the one or two percent interest payments for the next ten or twenty years. Um, they were they were marked at their fair value when when a hundred is a bond issued when rates are at six percent or when rates are at five percent for you know or six seven percent for mortgages. So a hundred that that's the baseline plus the seven percent interest rate. So your you know one two three percent yield isn't worth a hundred cents on the dollar when there's 20 years of that duration. So, so, so the Fed's basically saying, you know, we'll ignore that for a year. I think that are, are up to a year, their credit extension facility, and, and you'll be able to, that collateral will be, be valued at, at par before the, the duration drawdown. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, it's certainly interesting how fast they reacted. Markets are loving it. Um, but I, I think it gives them, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna continue to tighten. I think this mini crisis will be kind of like a line in the sand um just like the from the response from last time like they you know responded they did tarp they did all this other stuff but markets didn't bottom right away I'm not saying you know short sell stocks or buy puts or whatever like or don't have cash or have cash i think people often like take some of these statements too literally but uh they're going to continue to hike in my estimation and it's gonna probably take a couple more little tumbles before like what what we think of as a policy response normally will, will occur um, because the world doesn't work, this 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 debt based system won't work for long um, with actually restrictive monetary policy. And inflation is pretty persistent. And I think it stays persistent. So whether they actually you know take off that two percent mandate or whatnot, or they actually get that if if inflation gets back to two percent, the economy is extremely ugly. That's how hot everything is. And so the, in, in pursuit of that mandate, I think they're gonna they're going to blow some, some stuff up. I think this is probably, you know, one of the first things we see blow up in the States. They've been blowing up a lot of shit. Yep. Blew up, I mean, inflation is still running bubble. extremely hot. Yeah. It's people thought it was like, more they haven't blown that up yet. <laughs> yeah, they haven't. Um, and what would have helped blow it up is, you know, if all these uh, uh, depositors didn't have their money, but obviously they, they didn't think that was politically palatable. Um, which I guess you could have expected. Uh, I think we said last in the last uh, episode, two months, we're like, they're going to get their money, right? Like we talked about, ba- Matt and I literally talked about bank runs, about there being two, you know, $100 billion of FDIC insurance for $9 trillion of insured deposits. Uh, talked about social media being a super spreader for bank runs uh, and how, you know, trust and confidence is a fickle thing. Uh, and then we said, yeah, and then it's going to, it's going to blow up and they're going to get bailed. They're going to get bailed out and the loss is going to be socialized. And I didn't think it would happen. I, we said, we thought it happened internationally. And, then internationally. <laughs> um, and it happened domestically first, which is quite, quite, you know, amazing. Um, not rooting for anything bad, obviously, but it's, it's uh, you know, the left bell curve, Bitcoin, Bitcoin maxi instinct is remarkably right sometimes. Yeah, definitely left curve. Uh, I mean, so the, I mean, European markets open first, European banks open first. Um, does, yeah, we have USDC back on par. Um, do, do we see, do we expect to see bank runs over in Europe over this next few weeks? Like, is that, is that, I, I assume a lot of Europeans are aware of the issues that are happening here. Um I, I'm not sure how uh, 
the European. Do, how do you think this all plays out over the next few weeks with, with everything we know now? Japan opens in 50 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I, I dude, I'm not sure. I, I just expect some, some, uh, some shit to get messed up. Uh, but this is a, they certainly reacted pretty fast here. Um, which is fascinating. I think USDC on my ticker is not 98 cents, but maybe that's not updated uh, on the Coinbase pair. Um, but yeah, USDC probably, I'm going to be fascinated to see how much of their portfolio is redeemed because of trust gets shattered. Um, and, and, you know, maybe the SEC even steps in, right? Um, uh, Cause they, they basically called Paxos's instrument a security their Paxos issued BUSD, you know, Binance is USD stable coin. That wasn't theirs, right? Because Binance can't get a, you know, isn't a US regulated financial institution. Um, and so maybe this is like one of the things that they come come uh, after circle for. Because something that's trading at 98 cents, whether that's their fault or not, right? They're issuing this thing on a blockchain. Uh, they have money in a bank and people are literally buying this like, you, you know, the SEC's Howey test, you know, if you have, if something has an expectation of profit, people are like, oh, stable coins aren't, you know, at $1, no one's buying an expectation of a profit. But like the whole timeline for crypto Twitter this weekend was like buying the dip on USDC to like make it all back on leverage, right? Like, and so it was yep. pretty funny just like how this stable coin now is like people are buying it on an expectation of profit. Um, not saying like, I hope the SEC or anyone else comes in, but like, come on guys, I think the writing's on the wall for a lot of this stuff. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't, ex I wouldn't be surprised at all to see it go back to par, uh, and there for, for there to be a hell of a lot of redemptions come, come Monday, Tuesday in terms of like, you, you know, USDC supplies at 40 billion. What's the over under for the end of the week? That's a great question. <laughs> what do you think? I think you have to be batshit fucking crazy to be holding any significant amount of USDC right now. I mean, I think you had to be already, but especially now. Yeah. Like that doesn't, it just doesn't, it doesn't compute to me, but I mean, there's a lot of idiots out there. Um, so, I mean, I understand like the emerging markets, global South narrative, like people demand dollars in places where they can't get dollars otherwise. And I'm sure a lot of them rely on USDC and that makes sense to me. Like you have no other option. Hopefully they're holding a, a portion in Bitcoin. Hopefully they understand the risk they're taking and, and they just want that US dollar exposure. Um, but that can't be the overwhelming majority has to be big funds, right? That are holding USDC. Um, like big traders, big funds, institution kind of level stuff. And like they must have better options. Like why, why, why hold, why hold this fuck it? Like USDC has all the counterparty risks that banks have. And then it's added <laughs> this additional risk added on top. Um, and then you're also not making any quote unquote yield off of it. Circle gets all of it. Um, yeah. Unless you're holding it in like Coinbase and then Coinbase says, if you hold USDC on Coinbase, you get, Coinbase fucking counterparty risk. <laughs> yeah, I I, I don't really so, get you to hold stable coins either. But I mean, the bullish Bitcoiner in me says like this is Bitcoin, Bitcoin like the aha moment for Bitcoin, and you know, uh, the bear goes into hibernation and we just start fucking ripping. But I'm humble enough to remind myself that that's probably just moon boy bullshit and I'm wrong. Um, but it's got to be the curtain draw close off moment for USDC. Like, how is like, how is it not for that? Like, I mean, it, it's one thing if you're keeping two million dollars in Citibank or JP Morgan. Or, you know, Wells Fargo or something, but to to keep two million dollars in usdc or five million dollars in usdc or ten million dollars in fucking usdc it just sounds crazy to me who are these people <laughs> yeah it's a great question um <laughs> I, i'm not very i'm not very sure to be honest i don't in a zero interest rate policy world having stable coins you know as long as you're not 
like doing anything and i say doing anything illegal like in the sense of where you, you can get those funds arbitrarily frozen because like otherwise they in theory shouldn't freeze them all that much right like um but i get having ease of use you know unchained dollars in a world where policy rates are zero um but having usdc on coinbase yeah. getting two percent it's just like it's just a game of hoopla in my opinion just holds hold cash or hold bitcoin um, you're better off holding t-bills in whatever brokerage account you're using yeah. And this is, you know, Matt, this is obviously a very Western perspective. Shout out to the plebs out there that will never buy T-bills. That's what I'm saying. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll never buy T-bills. I don't even know how to buy T-bills. It's <laughs> a good point, Matt. USDC um, at 98.3. But, but that's what I'm saying. Like the, the Global South emerging markets idea of stable coins, like it makes sense to me as long as they understand the risk. But it's just not the majority of holders. Like it just can't be. Um, and it just does not line up that way, logically. I mean, we got to stay on this stream, Dylan, because who knows what's going to drop next. Yeah, I'm. This has been a fun. It was a good good idea by you. We were originally going to stream at five uh, to all the to all the freaks out there tuning in. <laughs> And Matt was like, no, let's do let's do 6 p.m. because futures are gonna open. And I was like, it's the best day. that's the best idea you've ever had, Matt. It's good. You're you're all over the market these days. There you go. I know when I know when FUT's open, but <laughs> I don't I don't really understand them or how any of this shit works. I just know that Bitcoin is awesome. Um what else yeah. we got in the docket? I, uh, I we had a few we had a few more topics. I don't know, dude. I just, I mean, first of all, this live chat is fucking hopping. So if anyone wants us to cover anything in the live chat, just let us know. Um, I mean, Dylan already went over this, where the safest place to hold cash is. I mean, if you're under 250K in America, you're probably safe wherever. Because the government will just backstop you. <laughs> but yeah. Dylan, like, don't worry, Dylan likes T-bills. Well, yeah, I mean... Again, people are going to give me shit for being like having cash. It's funny too, because like this has been covering kind of like a little bit of both worlds. Like I'm naturally a Bitcoiner at heart. I got orange pill. I said, you know, dropped out of school, said, screw it. I'm going to do this Bitcoin thing and figure it out. And, you know, I've moved to cover, obviously, um, which is what I went to college for, is what I was originally planning to do is be, you know, be some Wall Street yuppie. Um, so the bonds and interest rates and all this other stuff, you know, were fascinating to me. And so the macro people are like, oh, you dumb Bitcoiner. <laughs> like, why would you hold any of the, and, you know, any of that while my, like, you know, my net worth was 100%, 110% Bitcoin. <laughs> and now I still have a whole lot of Bitcoin and I have some cash too. And the, the Bitcoiners are like, you idiot. <laughs> and so it's just, it's just funny. I love it. Get it both ways. Yeah. You're getting grilled on both sides. Yeah. I feel, I sleep really well at night. Um, and and honestly, there's nothing more uh, assuring than a, a fat stack of Bitcoin that you know how to access that your loved ones would know about in a case of an emergency uh, that that, you know, you can walk around in your head if you were motivated enough and access your wealth anywhere in the world. It's a really powerful feeling. Um, and so I encourage people to, to, to really if even not if you don't take a leap right away, you should really learn about how self-custody works, how to do it. Uh, and because that that's quite a powerful thing where we you know, we talk a lot about, and I guess like I talk a lot about like, you know, investments and performance and markets and stuff. And you've been, and Matt, like you and Marty were like really uh, instrumental in a lot of, a lot of my teachings from like a tech perspective. Cause that wasn't my, uh, that wasn't my background. Um, and that's one of the coolest rabbit holes to go down um, as someone that's fascinated in markets too, but like dab, you know, have increasingly dabbled in the tech side of things. Um, there's no, there's no crazier feeling than sending, you know, sending some on-chain Bitcoin with a, you know, software node that you set up and verified yourself as a kind of voluntary participant in this open global network. Like grasping that is just like, is like a, the first time you do it is a pretty mind blowing thing. Um, especially in the light of all these centralized counterparties increasing, increasingly failing. It's, it's, uh, you know, just a wonderful, beautiful dichotomy of worldviews. Um, and so obviously as Westerners, we, can live in both worlds. Uh, 
but you know, a lot of, a lot of the world doesn't have that privilege. Yeah. I mean, I look, self-custody is truly empowering. Uh, it's really cool. You know, I've done a lot of edu- on the education side. I've done a lot on the education side and it's pretty cool seeing it light up for people. Um, I will say like on a personal side, um, I mean, I had a, I had a friend over today who already kind of understood Bitcoin, but he rushed over to today because, uh, he had a lot of money in a personal account and a personal bank account and he saw everything happening. Um, and he wanted to like set up his cold card finally and, and like hold his own keys and get through the process. And, um, you know, he goes to press, uh, he goes to press withdraw on the brokerage account that he was holding his Bitcoin on. I'm not going to dox which one that was. And it, said, oh, you have to verify your identity. And then he verified his identity. It's like, we'll get back to you in two days. So uh, for all the newcomers out there, I, I think it's an important time to remind you, remind you that if you're considering adopting a better money, such as Bitcoin, um, whether you go the KYC or no KYC route, it's going to be a slow process that you have to get comfortable with and then you know, if you're using a KYC regulated exchange, they're going to they're going to require you're going to have to ask their permission to, to get your Bitcoin. So it's going to take some time. Um, so get your act together, get it together sooner rather than later, because when you're when we're actually in a crisis, it's going to be too late um, and you will be fucked. So hopefully it woke up a lot of people and hopefully now they have a little bit more time to actually get their act together. But also on the flip side, if you're expecting this to have a substantial impact on the Bitcoin markets, um, it will take a little time for that to play out. Like the guys, the VCs that are all freaking out, um, if they decided that now they want to put some of their corporate treasuries or their portfolio companies and corporate treasuries into Bitcoin, like it's going to take them some time to do that. Um, So that will be a lagging. That's kind of a lagging kind of thing. Um, but it was pretty cool watching him, you know, set up his cold card for the first time. And then, and we just followed my guide. Like uh, we run btc.com slash cold card. So it's available for all of you. Um, if you're trying to set up your cold card for the first time, it's easier than you think. I like this question from, uh, I like this. Where is it? So many questions. One smart fella. He goes, who's responsible for the hash rate ripping and why is it Russia? Great question. <laughs> That's funny. Um, that's everybody. It should People be interesting. The nation state, the nation state game theory gets really interesting here on uh, the Bitcoin side because as trust erodes, you know the nation states, especially the nation states with sovereign wealth funds, um, they got to be starting to ask themselves how exposed they are to counterparties, and mm. you know putting one percent or five percent or ten percent or everything into Bitcoin. Doesn't seem so crazy anymore. <laughs> that yeah, I mean the real fun is like you know if they put one percent or not even one percent because they couldn't even in their wildest dreams get one percent of this capital without absolutely ripping the price. So maybe that's what they're forced to do. Unless they buy hash. The part. Yeah, true. Um, I don't know if you, Matt. I've, I mean, I'm sure you've talked about this a million times in other episodes. Maybe you haven't, um, but I'm not familiar with your thoughts on. Uh, Jason Lowry and his whole thesis and shtick and, you know, recent book and, uh, you know, supposed talks with the Pentagon and White House or whatever. Uh, I don't know if you even <laughs> want to touch on that, but what are your thoughts? I usually just try and not give him any airtime, period. Uh, I definitely did not pay for his thesis. Uh, no <laughs> desire to do that. I'd rather stack sats. Um, Someone's spooked. I, uh, I mean, yeah, he's quite, liter- quite literally I mean, spooked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you looked at his LinkedIn, he has a top tier spook uh, resume. And he's like been at all the agencies. Uh, I don't have LinkedIn, but I've gotten screenshots of his LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's a professional spook. He literally is. So that's not uh, a rumor or something to that regard. Um, I think it's dangerous. I, I think words matter. Um, I think Bitcoin... Bitcoin, the protocol is robust and needs to be robust uh, to to nation state attacks, particularly censorship. 
Um, and I think Bitcoin is, is, is well situated in that role. I mean, if you start to talk about financial regs and stuff like that, you know, it's a long arm of the U.S. government, right? They went after BitMEX and the Seychelles. It doesn't really matter where you're located. Uh, they will come after you. So if we're actually going to be trying to build the base of a whole new distributed censorship resistant financial network, it needs to be robust and, and protected from attacks. And so it doesn't really matter what people say on Twitter or their thesis or whatever in terms of Bitcoin. Um, the protocol. Now, for individual Bitcoiners that are living in America, like ourselves, uh, words do matter. And referring to Bitcoin as a weapon is a line of reasoning and, and narrative adjustment. And, and yeah. I would say that I say that as someone who I believe Bitcoin is a defensive tool. I believe Bitcoin is a defensive tool for property rights. I believe encryption is a defensive tool for freedom of speech. Um, these aren't offensive tools. You, you, know, you, you can't kill anyone with a Bitcoin. Um, th these are not you know, weapons of war. Uh, but if you start going down that rabbit hole, if you start going down that narrative line and you start getting other Bitcoiners to agree with you and start parroting those kind of lines, um, it becomes much easier for the U.S. government specifically to target Bitcoiners um, and hit us with onerous regulations and make our lives really, really fucking difficult. And I really feel like that is what he's doing. Um, it kind of seems almost too obvious, but that's what makes it effective. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's just it's extreme. It's extremely dangerous. And I would say I say this as someone who I've said many times financial crisis happens or it seems like it's happening. It's happening. Right. Like. It's happening. Gif, like we have Ron Paul. Um, like we are the easiest scapegoats. The U.S. government shut down small businesses. Small businesses are the most loved sec sector of our economy. Period. Everyone loves their small businesses. Everyone wants to go to Main Street and talk to their local fucking bar barkeep and 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 frequent them and and support them and do all this other stuff and they just turned a blind eye when all those businesses got closed and their livelihoods were taken away if you don't think that people will just easily throw bitcoiners under the bus if their bank mm -hmm. deposits are getting rugged while hyperinflation's happening and they can't withdraw cash and and talking heads on cnn are saying the bitcoiners are all gloating on rabbit hole recap every week like that is like just a recipe for targeting us. And you add in like Bitcoin as a weapon and you're like waving around a fucking handgun on, on podcasts. Like you're just, you're just setting up that narrative. Yeah. I mean, that's going to happen in like, you know, four years or something. No, that's, yeah. that's <laughs> maybe aggressive. Um, but that's gonna I mean, Matt, like everything. Well, four years you said. Is 2027. I, I, I pulled that out of my, out of my ass respectively, uh, respectfully, but, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's going at like the mandibles, the, you know, maybe this is a pessimist. Mandibles. Thing, but yeah. It's gonna like, that's, that's obviously the trend, right. Is this in, you know, for 40 years post, you know, we went 71. What happened with, what, what the fuck happened in 1971, the website, uh, pretty cool. A lot of those are coincidence. Um, or, you know, maybe just kind of like a trend uh, for, for money in society. We had, you know, globalized the world. Inflation was super low for this one period of time. Um, as the world was industrializing, we've kind of, you know, it maybe if some people say globalization hasn't topped, but it's clear that we've hit some sort of inflection point. It that, you know, the pessimistic side of me says, well, geopolitically, it looks like we're headed for some form of you know, not World War Three. hopefully, not a hot war, but at least somewhat of a cold war. Uh, and, and all these, you know, national interests are kind of, you know, saying me first for the first time instead of uh, opening up to the world. That's going to lead to more and more inflation. And the debt and the demographic side everywhere in the world is ugly. And so these are kind of things that like uh, all of the, the virtuous cycles that we saw the last, you know, 40 years that people expect as normal, like living standards only go up and wealth only goes up, stocks only go up, and and it's it's like you know this kind of peacetime thing. I think you're gonna get maybe get their face ripped off in the 2020s or 2030s. Who knows when this happens? But like, I we I don't think we've hit the uh, the the point of max ma not max pain but max uh, chaos 
I think we're still on the, the you know, kind of the escalation phase, acceleration phase, and we haven't hit that crescendo. And so maybe that's like a pessimistic take, but like all, you know, that, that thought of, of, you know, uh, accelerated inflation where Bitcoin is pushing, like maybe it's approaching seven figures past seven figures. Um, and, and I suspect that seven figure Bitcoin, whenever it does hit, uh, which I do expect in my lifetime, the buying power of those dollars will be a lot less than a million today. And so the Bitcoiners will be saying, I told you so. And, and, you know, are at least thinking it uh, at a time when there's probably going to be like, you know, uh, incumbent power structures that are, that are failing or flailing. Uh, and it's going to be quite the, like the dichotomy. And yeah, we are, I think it's, it's clear that, you know, propaganda will come. Bitcoiners will be demonized. Um, but I think that's probably just a bump, a bump in the road, but that's coming. Like the timeline is unknown. Um, uh, but I, I, I fully, fully am in, you know, in line with you on that being the trend. It's quite obvious. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think part of the thing is like if, and one of the reasons I focus on education so much is I think if, if, if we can help, if we can help more people use the tools before this kind of chaos starts to really unfold hard, um, there'll be a lot of people out there that are very grateful they have Bitcoin as an option. Hmm. Um, I just don't think we're going to, and maybe this, maybe this is the pessimist of me too. I, I call myself a, doomer optimist and i just i i think alternatives uh like as people get burnt it'll feel better alternatives but i just don't think i i i, th I think shit is breaking faster than people are finding the alternatives like bitcoin um yeah and that just seems like the realistic expectation and it you know kind of is what it is um we have a question in the chat for you, Dylan, um, your thoughts on synthetic USD like stable sats as an alternative to stable coins. Do you have any thoughts there? Uh, stable sats. Is that the, uh, what's stable sats? Stable, stable sats, sats is what's run by Galois money. And it's this idea of a pool that goes short. Uh, they go short the dollars. Um, yeah. Yeah. And like, okay, coin and stuff. And then so yeah. people get uh, the equivalent of a dollar balance in their wallet, uh, but it's really backed by uh, Bitcoin long positions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. Bitcoin shorts. Um, they, like, you know, Bitcoin. Yeah, it's uh, backed by Bitcoin shorts. Yeah. People are inherently yeah. short Bitcoin. The, the yeah. user that's like, holding the dollar balance is short Bitcoin. And the person that's backing it up, the market maker, is long Bitcoin. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's a cool, cool concept. The gold, the golden goose for like, you know, and I, again, this is just like a, a temporary solution to people wanting dollars. Is like, you know, a quote unquote like decentralized Bitcoin futures market where where people can hold synthetic dollars, like Bitmex. You know, you can hold a dollar position because. You could just short Bitcoin on one X. That right. was like Arthur was like the first guy to figure that out, but it's centralized. And so no one's been able to figure out a decentralized thing. And there's kind of like an implementation on Ethereum, but from Ethereum's core, it's not as decentralized as Bitcoin, obviously um, from a monetary policy perspective. Are you talking from, about MakerDAO? Uh, well, uh, I mean, MakerDAO, um, I mean, uh, DAI being an over collateralized, big, uh, uh, over collateralized stable coin um, with, but it's collateralized with USDC, right? Yeah, because they collateralized it with ETH, but it's too volatile, <laughs> and you had to put up too much. So they're like, "Oh yeah, we'll just do USDC." So uh, there's also like a, you know perpetuals and whatever, um, but no one's been able to really figure out how to do it in Bitcoin. Uh, but you don't really need to. Like, I think you're going to find an implementation built on Lightning, probably. Um, that looks like it's happening. Um, but you well, know, so there's an that, interesting that, one. I mean, I know the questions for you, but. The freaks know I'm extremely bullish on Fediments, the open source protocol. And there's this concept, um, there's a concept with Fediments. So the idea of Fediments is we have all these different Fediments, these essentially multi-sig custodians that are located around the world, and they can be small community Fediments, they could be larger Fediments. And within those, you could have stability pools where it's similar to stable sats, but instead of relying on a um, centralized exchange on the back end, 
um, it's all done within the Fediment. So some people are going long Bitcoin and then other people are pegging to the fiat. Um, and the nice advantage there is obviously you still have counterparty risk. Uh, you still can get rugged. But one of the big issues we're seeing is um, the, the existing stablecoin market, as we currently see it, um, is a winner take most. People want liquidity. Uh, people want liquidity and they want reputation is basically the two reasons that people will choose a stable coin. And as a result, we've seen Tether dominate because Tether is inherently black market money. Um, you know, they, they have been fighting the U.S. government since their inception. They got created in the first place because there was a banking blockade on Bitcoin businesses um, and they needed an alternative for on the fiat side of the equation. Um, and then we have USDC on like the heavily regulated cuck side that people like that is backed by like BlackRock and Goldman. Um, and as a result, they've taken the lion's share of market. But what that means is they're massive targets. Um, they're massive targets. They're, they represent systemic risk to everything, not just the Bitcoin uh, industry. I mean, I think Circle goes down like that's massive contagion effect across fucking everything. Um, and they're massive targets to the U.S. government. So if you have smaller liquidity pools, stability pools, located around the world, then if one gets rugged or another one gets rugged, it's like small regional bank failures, right? Yeah. It's not like a too big to fail kind of situation where you have everyone get rugged at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Matt, what do you think about what do you, <laughs> this is a, a tweet from, I'm sure you're familiar, Ryan Selkis, uh, CEO of Masari. Uh, <laughs> Tweets out, crypto banking rails have been effectively shuttered in less than a week. Next up, USDC. The message from DC is clear. Crypto is not welcome here. And then the second tweet is, the entire industry should be fighting like hell to protect and promote USDC from here on out. It's the last stand for crypto in the US. Uh, do you, do you want to share your thoughts on that? Or uh, do we I just... Think, do, do... <laughs> I think, first of all, I think, first of all, um, the only true stable coin is Bitcoin. I've been screaming that at the top of my lungs for fucking years. Um, and I think it will become obvious to more and more people. Uh, it's a proper stable foundation. No one controls it. Um, you can spend and save without permission. It is the most stable thing that exists on this fucking planet on a financial perspective. Um, it's property rights enforced at the, at the code level. Uh, People don't realize yep. that yet. But I would say uh, there's a tweet that I resurfaced from 2018 uh, or 2019. It was when USDC launched. Everyone was, I don't know if you remember, I, I don't know if, if you remember back then, but like people were really excited about regulated stable coins were the future. Mm -hmm. Like that was going to be like our future. And people have just completely lost the fucking plot. Like the whole reason if, 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 if governments and corporations could provide us with property rights and a stable money and protect our speech, we wouldn't need any of these tools. We don't, you don't need freedom tech in those situations. They'll just provide it for you. The whole reason is they fucking broke everything and they will continue to break everything. And you can't build things with the expectation of, of getting permission. You can't build things that are not robust and secure from, from external forces in the first place. So, you know, all these people have completely lost the plot. We discovered this, this native digital bearer asset that is censorship resistant, Bitcoin. Um, and then everyone decided to build digital IOUs that require trusted third parties and call that the future over Bitcoin and just completely went full circle back to a pre-Bitcoin kind of situation. So I think all these people are going to get rugged. They're all going to get fucking wrecked. And then people will realize, and it's going to take a while. And it's going to be super painful. And I thought this week was going to teach people a lesson. But if, I mean, I'm sure you got plenty of fucking engagement off of that. People are like, this is our last stand. Like we got to protect USDC. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe I, I you mean, guys bags. Well, yeah, I mean, USDC is back, back close to, uh, close to a buck or whatever. Um, I don't think, I, I don't think they learned their lesson per se because they got bailed out, but uh yeah I, I i think circle may be uh taken out and you know shot behind the shed by the authorities or regulators on terms of like you know 
they're like, you know, what they could say like AML, KYC, whatever. Um, Cause like, again, they, there yeah. is somewhat of a choke point going on for, cause despite Bitcoin pumping, you know, in the last hour and a half, right? Like I, you know, Bitcoin going pumping from 20, 20 K to 22 K like, okay. You know, we're still kind of in the same place for the last nine months, which is great. I hold Bitcoin. I hold a bunch of it. Um, but That's like good. there's a, there's, there, <laughs> yeah, it is good. I need more though. Never enough. Um, but there is a choke point going on. And I think that's the thing that, you know, may or may not be priced into the market. And, you know, also is probably the biggest, going to be the biggest like headwind for the next year is like, okay, how does the next, because I do suspect there's going to be a hundred billion dollars of plus of capital that's going to be put into Bitcoin in the, in the coming years. Right. And that's going to lead to a much more than greater than a hundred billion dollars of appreciation in the market cap you know the market cap is going to go up by trillions and i i suspect it eventually on what timeline that's unknown um but how those rails how that next hundred billion comes in how the, well first of all how does the next billion how's the next 10 billion then we can talk about 100 but i do suspect 100 uh and then much much more how does that flow into bitcoin and that's probably like you yeah. said the regulatory capture yeah. part of it that's in place and that's going to probably you know do they have it set up for the 2024 halving to pump our bags? Who knows? Uh, but that's their plan is for the incumbents to eat all this. And, uh, you know, no new kids get any of the any of the fun. We, they had the 2017 and 2021 cycles to have their fun. And the next time they're going to try to have it under wraps. I think that's what's kind of happening under the hood. Because like they will. They, yeah. while uh, we're on air. Um, <laughs> they will pump our bags. I have... Uh, you're, you're multi multifunctional. I, uh, there's three paths for you to, from a practical perspective. There's three paths for USDC. They either get rugged because of counterparty risk, um, and, and are insolvent, right? They either get completely KYC cucked and permissioned, right? Where it's essentially becomes, you know, a, a quasi CBDC, you know, not necessarily directly run by a, like a private CBDC, not directly run by the central bank, but there's massive surveillance, there's censorship, KYC, lots of permission, completely lost the plot in that situation. Um, or they get shot behind the shed because they don't do that. Right. Those mm -hmm. are the three paths for USDC. Um, all three of those paths are fucking horrible and not why I'm part of this movement. Like it just, it just doesn't that, that that's what are we even building here? Like what, what, what is even the point? Um, yep. I might as well just use fucking Venmo. Yeah, agreed. Love it. Awesome, Dylan. Uh, I mean, this was a great rip. Uh, I didn't expect USDC going back to par um, while we were on air. I didn't expect signature. Did you bank expect to a bailout while we were on air? Yeah, that was wild. Did you expect a bailout, of, a full bailout? They, you know, they were kind of positioning this, which is it's not it's they're going to be very clear that this is not a bailout. This is depositors <laughs> yeah. getting yeah. money. Right. Uh, and they, they were kind of, I, at least I saw like some kind of positioning about that, like, Oh, back up depositors, but don't actually bail out the bank. Don't actually, you know, protect shareholders and management and whatnot. Um, but no, I didn't think they could move this fast. Uh, lucky it happened on a weekend and everything shut down just because they always shut down on weekends, which is still crazy to me. But What's crazy um, now is like, I expect the contagion like, to still spread tomorrow morning. Like, I don't think, I think people are scared and I think they should be. Like, I don't think the money in the bank is not yours. I think every bank is, is every fractional reserve bank, which is the overwhelming majority of them is, is inherently insolvent. Um, <laughs> and, uh, how do people watch this last week? I mean, some people didn't even see it, right? We're in our own little bubble, but people are going to wake up. Social media is going to spread it. And uh, they're going to have some really major, they have major systemic structural issues here that none of this solves. This is all just kicking a can down the road. Yep. At best. It's at best is kicking a can. Yeah. The, People are like, so the, the facility they just set up where like the banks can lend against their, their, uh, 
long duration securities at par value for up to a year. It's like implicit QE in a way, if at least for like a year, it allows a can kick. So like if they had this policy up by last Wednesday, Silicon Valley Bank wouldn't have gone under because right. they, they, they were, you know, fiat accounting standard solvent mark to market uh, as $42 billion of withdrawals were coming. They were not solvent. Um, so, I mean, liquidity can't solve a solvency problem, but it was a liquidity issue because again, it's a, that duration mismatch. So mark to market, their books, right. they were solvent, but when you actually need to sell the securities that have an unrealized loss, well, you're not. Uh, and so this kind of, like if they wouldn't have failed, Silicon Valley Bank wouldn't have gotten, wouldn't have zeroed. Uh, Signature, I think, was a, was a KYC AML thing. And increasingly, they were looking like they were going to, to maybe suffer a similar fate if there was a panic, which there was, which is why they got wound down. But, um, you know, aside from like, maybe there's, you know, one or two other banks that are bad and who knows what panic happens this week or in the coming months. Um, I think this facility will allow some of them to pay, potentially escape that in the near term in terms of a bank run, which will allow them, I think, well, the entire purpose of this is to allow them to continue to just to tighten. To, they're going to continue to to jack rates up because, you know, this would have been a, a decent, you know, like the market was saying, oh, you know, they got to cut now. They can't. And they, you know, they made the depositors hold bank zeroed, right? Like that's, I honestly, it's from a Keynesian economic perspective, it's a pretty good play. The Austrian anarcho-capitalist in me is like, screw them, bail out no one, assume your own risk, you're an unsecured creditor. Uh, I'm not ruined for bailouts or not. It's just as part of the system and I can't control it, so I don't really care. Well, um, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty right. good Keynesian a, band-aid. As someone who's already opted out and essentially 100% in Bitcoin, uh, if, you, if you base also like all the time and effort I put into the Bitcoin movement, I'm probably way over hundred percent all in. Um, mm -hmm. I've already opted out. I don't really care if they fucking debase the money. Um, I actually like, it's kind of, I had some friends affected by SVB. I told you already the friend who it works in a non Bitcoin startup, who she just wasn't going to get paid or payroll. Um, so like, at least they have a little bit more time to get their shit together. Um, from like that perspective, I guess, like I'm, I'm not rooting for like people to lose their money in their homes and their jobs. Um, but it should be, I mean, this has got, I, I, I imagine this has got to be a wake up. I mean, so going back pre pre signature getting shut down like an hour ago, uh, pre Silicon Valley bank run, which was like, basically Peter Thiel just was like, withdraw all your money and then everyone just fucking ran the fucking bang. Um, we had Silvergate who doesn't seem like they had any really duration mismatch or anything. It seems like they were almost well, they did. fully reserved. Yeah, they did have it. That's they, why the stock, they, they had to liquidate a long portfolio, but then once they did, they had enough cash like in January. Um, but then they depositors survived just left and depositors. Nothing. Yeah, they survived depositors removing 85% of their funds. Yeah. Right? Like billions of dollars things, was yeah. withdrawn from that bank and they still survived. And then more money came out. So, like, how many banks can survive that? Not many banks can survive that. And people are not going to stay in regional banks in this situation. People are not going to stay in the small banks. Like, they're, they're, everyone's going to be moving to the big guys or, you know, the few of us moving to Bitcoin, you're not already there. Um, and they're all going to do it from their phones. And, they're, you know, it's all going to be wires. It's like the new bank run is the wires and like ACH and shit. It's not people like going to the bank and pulling their cash out. Yeah, they, they so it's a I don't know, it's there too. I, I would imagine that... Uh... I mean, they, they said there's a $25 billion fund. I, I, I do suspect that there's going to be something that we probably can't predict, whether it's, you know, pensions or, you know, insurance or, you know, the, the fact that, like, you know, maybe USCC gets redeemed, they have to liquidate a bunch of treasuries. Like, this is still a pretty illiquid market everywhere. We are still going through lag effects of the biggest asset bust in aggregate terms ever. 
uh, you know, and this inflation thing is pretty embedded and uh, the labor market's just barely beginning to see some weakness, um, which this would have accelerated. But I, I, I they're, they're going to have to really kick this can. And this was just a little toe tap. You know, this is just like they pushed the, they pushed they pushed the can upwards a few inches. They didn't punt it and they're going to have to punt, I think, uh, pretty, pretty damn hard. Um, and that's when the real like Bitcoin's being adoption is being built under the surface. And a lot of people are getting orange pilled with stuff like this. Um, but you're going to be able to see on the monthly chart when people really get it because Bitcoin's once again, broken its all time high and absolutely going parabolic again. And then we'll probably all say this time is different and it's hyper Bitcoinization and it'll crash by 80%. <laughs> it's probably what happens for, for, for usual. It'll crash the global economy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I would have been, I would have been pretty pissed off if they they actually like bailed out the bank in full, and like the shareholders were fine and management was still there and collecting massive bonuses. Um, because then no one learns their lesson, which is what we saw in two thousand eight. <laughs> this I like free market. This is a pretty, this is a pretty funny tweet. From uh, from an anon, I won't I won't list his name or whatever. Um, you want QE? You want more QE? You want Bitty to fifty k by next week? Ethereum to three point five k? We can ignore that. <laughs> Run the fucking banks. They'll have to increase the backstop. <laughs> oh my god, the absolute state of things, man. If you want more QE, just run the banks. Oh, it reminds me of the GameStop world. situation. Remember Cloud the GameStop world. situation? That feels like so long ago now. I uh, yeah. I mean, and what did we talk about last? We talked about this two months ago, too. Um, like the FDIC insurance is, is, is like negligible and compared to the amount of deposits that exist. Like, I wonder how many people are looking into that now. Like, people must be paying more attention. I don't know. It should be interesting. I'm I'm very glad that I'm I'm sleeping I'm sleeping in sats, and uh, I'm able to sleep easy at night because if I had any money, if I had a significant amount of money in banks, I'd be I'd be really really fucking I'd be having a, a lot of trouble sleeping. Agreed. Okay, Dylan, this was a great rip. We're nearing two hours. Uh, it's a Sunday night. They're not going to announce anything more today. Uh, Jeremy Allaire is grandstanding on Twitter about how Circle's back to par. USDC is back to par. Um, <laughs> I've said that uh, thread's not going to age well. Oh, that's right. What? <laughs> Signature's down. Silvergate's down. Silicon Valley Bank's down. We'll see how many more banks fall this next week. Um, do you have any final thoughts for, for our audience? Uh, yeah. Um, as per our last episode, what, what did I say? Um, uh, you, it was, it was, uh, you, were, you were telling me to say stay humble and stack stats, and I said, like, um, I don't even know, something uh -oh. and acquire Satoshi's. Uh, stay humble, but yeah, stay humble and acquire Satoshi's or something to that effect. Uh, it was something, something dumb. Yeah, I just oh no, just it was accumulate Bitcoin, the... right? It was, yeah, it was, I don't know, stay classy, it was a four, it was a four. Bitcoin or something like that. <laughs> something dumb. Yeah, no, this is a long game. Uh, people, people will wake up to the inevitable realities of this fiat clown world eventually. Um, uh, yeah, this has been fun. I have more for you, actually, real quick. Um, first of all, we have Bitcoin in the comments asking thoughts on Credit Suisse. Uh, it's, it's been dead in the water for a while. It's it's more just, I mean, it's a zombie. Uh, I don't think it's, they, they would, you know, there's going to be some form of merger or acquisition. Like Credit Suisse is more of a name at this point. There's going to be a merger acquisition or some form of, you know. I mean, uh, it's kind of funny. Like all the European banks, this is the same thing. They're all mark like functionally marked to market insolvent if there's a run because they're all loaded up on European government debt by mandates. That's why their their equity is all shit because they've been long European government debt at you know Germany's was literally a negative rate, so you'd pay a hundred bucks to get nine. You pay a hundred one dollars to get a hundred back in thirty years, right? Like 
this, this, and so all of those guys are, are mark to market wrecked when you, when you actually um, put the price where it's trading, but they don't do that. It's like, it's an accounting gimmick. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not like, again, I'm not a banking analyst, but um, when, when people want their money and withdraw it, it certainly gets interesting and fascinating, but the fed, the treasury, these guys can play a lot of stupid games. Um, you're going to hear probably a lot more word jargon in the next two years. Um as reasons for why they need to, you know, print money, which is not printing money, right? Like this is not a bailout guys. This is absolutely not. We're not bailing anybody out here. Um, but of course we know, we know it is. Uh, so I don't have any thoughts on, on Credit Suisse though, or, or uh, Deutsche. And then last but not least, because it wouldn't be a dispatch if I didn't put you on the spot is the bottom end. Looks like it. Yeah. I mean, for sure. It's uh, I think I like to always, I, I, I've learned to not like people are like, Oh, you know, you hedging your bets or whatever. It's like, yeah, like I can't speak in certainty. So I don't know. I will continue to have a little bit of cash and not, not be 110% into Bitcoin. Like I was, maybe it's just to sleep better, but um, it's, it's uh, I like having a little bit of both dry powders. Um, Cause like, you know, it could always be worse, but I think, yeah, is it with 15, five uh, that return to that level? I think you'd need to see probably, probably, 3,000, 2,800 for the SBX. Like that's going to be, that'd be quite the show. Um, but I don't know. I can't, I can't, I can't speak in certainties. Fair enough. I'm glad I asked the question regardless. Well, anyway, Dylan, thank you again for joining us. Um, hopefully we'll have you on again in two months and we'll do another market update. That'll be fun. Let's do it. Um, down to make it a kind of two month, three month thing. Just get, catching everyone let's fucking do it we'll make it a plan yes um huge shout out to dylan for joining us you can follow him on yeah go on what was that do i I have to stay in the lobby like for restream or is like for it to upload or anything just to be sure no you're good you're good okay i'm just gonna thank the freaks for joining us you can leave whenever you'd like to leave huge shout out to dylan for joining us huge shout out to the freaks who joined us in the live chat reminder that Dispatch is an audience funded show. We don't have ads or sponsors. It is only possible thanks to the donations, Bitcoin donations from you guys. You can donate to the show at sildispatch.com slash donate or through podcasting 2.0 apps. I appreciate you all. Bitcoin's the only true stable coin. Stay humble stack sats, and I'll see you next time. Peace.